So good morning, good afternoon. Um, I'm sure in some ways, good evening, um, everyone. Thank you so much for, for being here. I think Rebecca Bettencourt's comment around empowerment is a good anchor, frankly, for this conversation around how we uh, leverage um, the empowerment, uh, what we often refer to as agency uh, for, for students and frankly for communities at large. Um, this is a broad topic. Um, we talk about assessments uh, and pedagogy and curriculum. So I'm gonna to try to be disciplined uh, and narrow the conversation a bit, uh, but you can take your questions wherever you'd like and I'll do my best to actually respond um, to them. But before we jump into the work, I think it may be a good idea for uh, all of you to get the sense as to who we are at Digital Promise. Uh, we are a global, nonpartisan, nonprofit, but we were not born that way. Uh, we actually were agitated by uh, PBS television, public television in the U US and the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Um, as you can see on the right side, uh, Larry Grossman, it was a PBS um, powerhouse in the US and Newton Minner uh, was the FCC chairman who actually wrote this piece um, to begin to agitate the government to create this national center, which was authorized in 2008 by George W. Bush, uh, National Center for Research in Advanced Information and Digital Technologies. Um, we were launched by President Barack Obama and the Secretary of Education at the time, Arnie Duncan, in 2011. So we actually turned um, 10 um, in, a few, in a few weeks. And this is the actual picture of the org actually getting launched on September 16, 20, 2011. Our mission is pretty straightforward. Uh, we look to leverage innovation to improve equity and access to great learning experiences for all young people um, across the U.S. and around, and around the world. Um, we lean on four different constructs. Networks, we have a vast network of practitioners, uh, superintendents of schools, um, school leaders, teachers. Um, we work with nearly 60,000 teachers across the U.S. Uh, and particularly North, North, North America, uh, and about maybe 130, 140 school districts. We have an, an amazing research team um, that do a lot of work in the learning sciences. Um, and we have one part of that research construct is a research at work um, thing that we actually do because we really believe in research informing practice and practice informing research. This is two way bridge is really critical for us. But all of this anchors around this idea of powerful learning experiences, which we identify four different um, um, sort of focus areas. One that powerful learning is personal. So this really goes beyond this idea of personalized instruction, that uh, powerful learning experiences are authentic, they're challenging, they're collaborative and connected. Um, inquisitive, of course, um, and reflective. And we'll get a little bit into that as we go on to this um, conversation. We are, again, as I, as I mentioned, all over the US in Canada, um, at least 34 to 40 of our states. And we are in um, eight places, 15 places in eight countries around the world. Um, and I'm sure this map is outdated because our network continues to grow um, every, single, every single year. So let's talk a bit about um, this idea of making assessments really much more inclusive and relevant. Uh, we know a lot about, um, you know, curriculum and pedagogy. Um, but when you look at this particular chart, this particular slide, um, there's a lot of people who tend to assume that all of this is well connected, that when a child is not doing well, there's an intervention in place where the assessment tells you how a child is doing and the right kinds of interventions are put in place, et cetera. Uh, let me just perhaps disabuse you of that notion. This is a broken system. It is broken in most places around, around the US, um, I would argue even around the world. The, the pandemic actually did a lot to bring this into coherence. The learning management systems you may see that took hold in many places uh, because of the pandemic actually helped correct uh, quite a bit of this, uh, but the fact that it is broken. Interventions often are not connected to uh, the curriculum or pedagogical practice, and teachers are left to their own devices to figure out how to connect 
what they're learning about students to how they can reteach and intervene if a child is not actually learning. The second thing I will push on the slide is that we've made, again, we've made great uh, strides in curriculum, great strides frankly in pedagogical practice. Assessments are laggards. Um, they were not doing as well in creating the kinds of next generation assessments that really addresses uh, um, the kinds of needs that we see in our young people, especially those young people who are not making grade, who are not doing well um, in our schools. The fact is that you know we we've tried to to iterate, we've tried to innovate, but we continue the same kinds of practices across education, um, and frankly ignoring the fact that we have not done well with the most marginalized students. Um, you know, Einstein talks about the definition of insanity is repeating the same thing and expecting different outcomes. But the fact is that we do that. And more importantly, if you look at the bottom of the slide, that all of the innovators who are working in these, um, in these fields tend to be working in silos. Um, they're developing assessment without fully appreciating what it takes for a child, for a teacher to teach. Um, and, and of course you get this kind of broken uh, fragmented approach to solving what frankly is a comprehensive um, a set of issues. One of our um, uh, leaders in digital promises, amazing quote, which I love, uh, he talks about his, um, his son who loves uh, to fish. And if you give, were to give his son a 500 page book on fishing, he would read the whole thing very quickly. In fact, he's actually done, done the, uh, the assessment analysis that his son reads two grades above reading level when he's reading something he is really interested in. When you look at our um, uh, assessments, frankly, uh, across the board, we tend to uh, assess students on things, frankly, they are completely uninterested in, and we wonder why they don't do so, so, so well. And the effort about motivation for taking these tests, um, I think that's been an area of focus for a lot of educators, but the fact, the fact, the fact frankly, is that we have to do much more work in really changing the test to really lean on uh, creating value for the learner. Um, one of my colleagues at uh, Altitude Learning talks about frankly what assessment should look like, um, and it should, in his in his view, and frankly many agree with him that there are three areas of of um, that should be focused on in terms of assessment. Uh, one is idea of agency. I think uh, Rebecca talked a bit about that in the empowerment conversation, that we have to build agency of young people and their connection to their own learning. Uh, we have to design and build for the kinds of global citizen that we actually need. And of course, we've got to make this really relevant for the kinds of issues young people are seeing um, around the world. So let me go a bit. Uh, this is uh, a, a, on the right side, the actual cover of uh, my wife's dissertation at Columbia University some 16 years ago. And what she did there, um, if you all are familiar with the ways in which we teach reading, that uh, we tend to teach narrative uh, text to very young kids. And what she did was to demonstrate that you can teach expository text to students as young as in the second grade if you connect the, the, um, the, uh, the, the expository text to a protagonist, to a familiar uh, character in that in that young person's life. So connections, uh, in, in her case, she was using Harry Potter as a connection to the kinds of readings. And, and if you're familiar with the kinds of outcomes we see in, in, um, in elementary school reading, the fact is that we don't do very well in third, fourth grade expository text. For example, we teach young people about the house on the prairie. We teach them about how to re read narrative text. And then they come to the third or fourth grade and we say, go ahead and learn science. Golan history, Golan mathematics, and of course they they do not do not do very well. Uh, I used to be the head of the high school division in New York City, um, and the area of greatest need where we fell the most was in ninth grade social studies, ninth grade global history, because again that issue continued through high school for a lot of young people. So what we need, frankly, is a bit of a systemic uh, evolution. Uh, notice as it's systemic. It's not just one part of the ecosystem, but everything needs to move in unison. And again, this is again my, my colleague Devin at Altitude Learning who pushes the idea that the approach we have right now is has outlived its utility and frankly in great need of systemic uh, evolution. He also pushes that we need a paradigm shift in the way in which we think about education, uh, both in terms of policies, practices, tools, etc., that need to be. Um, framed in a way that connects all the pieces and looking at assessment um, 
not as a way of uh, uh, holding schools accountable, holding teachers or principals accountable, but as a means to an end, um, as opposed to an end in itself. And very often what we do is we use assessment as a sort of high stakes way of measuring uh, um, the efficacy of a school system or a school. While that may be important for um, some of our policymakers and folks who fund schools, but it does not do frankly much in terms of moving the achievement needle does not do very much frankly in helping students actually um, move forward. So one of the things that uh, we are doing at Digital Promise um, is looking at this idea of really creating uh, or leaning on inclusive innovation, excuse me, as, as, a, as a construct for beginning to solve this problem. And the issue we're talking about here is not just assessment. I want to lean on assessment, but not just on assessment. If you look on the right, you see what we mean um, in terms of the kinds of inclusivity we're talking about. It is not just educators, entrepreneurs, it's funders, investors, it's local and state, I would argue even federal government, um, in really embedding and, and being a part of the research community. And of course, um, most important, leaning on the communities that we actually serve and making sure we understand the context in which they actually live. Um, my four years at the Gates Foundation, uh, what, I, what I worked on was study of P16 education and most of our communities actually lean on P to workforce um, um, work. And what we learned a ton about was this idea of co-creation, co-designing of communities that as a funder coming in and giving money and pushing solutions in communities did not work. Uh, but co-creating with, with, with community, sitting with them, designing together is the way of sustaining the work and getting the kinds of uptake frankly, that so much of us uh, really care about. So important here to lean on this idea that, that inclusive innovation doesn't just invite people to the table, it puts them at the center of the conversation. When they have, and what's important too is when they are at the middle of this conversation, when they are, uh, co-creating and co-designing, one, you're going to get um, the uptake of solution um, and the delivery of solution is going to be much more effective. In, you know, if you look at the, 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 the pandemic as, as a corollary, um, designing the vaccine is critical, but vaccine delivery is also as critical. And unless you can get close to the people who have to take those vaccines and understand where they're coming from and work with them um, and build a trust and often perhaps use the intermediary to build trust. As you can see in what you've been hearing from government, sometimes this local pastor, it's the local doctor, is who they trust is, is where you have to get the vaccine to have the uptake. It's not different frankly from what we talked about in terms of education. Um, trust is, 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 is paramount. Um, we talk very often about this idea of implicit and explicit uh, dimensions of systems change, that explicit are the tools and solutions we design, but the implicit is, is the, is the um, sort of a, a, a trust you build with community. You may have heard the expression that you can only move at the speed of trust. Those are critically important. But coming back to our inclusive innovation uh, work at Digital Promise, we lead on three core uh, tenets. The idea that you have to intentionally design with the needs of the most marginalized groups, um, that you have to um, work with them in addressing the challenges that they see um, as well. Um, and of course, success is only defined uh, by again, how well they benefit from, uh, from this. So this idea of mutualism, I think is really, really critical um, in the effort. Um, in our inclusive innovation work, we didn't pull the, the construct out of thin air. It is really based on six uh, proven uh, um, um, experiences. Um, if you from DARPA um, in, uh, with the mil U.S. military, um, creating innovations, and again, you can set up these temporary teams two, two to five years uh, to solve persistent problems, but it's done in collaboration. Uh, much of perhaps what you see happen with the vaccine, with the kind of international collaboration, is critical. Um, Inqtel's work, um, again, as you can see, brings together government, venture capital. Uh, startups, et cetera, to solve again, those kinds of um, challenges. And I put here that the head of Inqtel was one of our board members of Digital Promise. So perhaps you can begin to see um, some of the DNA uh, that you see here. The Tamarack, the Tamarack Institute's work in Canada, I think they're getting on collective action, collective uh, solution um, work is being critical in our understanding. Uh, PCORI's work on um, health, uh, which I believe was born out of the uh, Obamacare, 
work, again, engages community in the development of and the uptake of, of, of solutions in healthcare. Um, the, the fifth, uh, if you heard the work from, um, I think, uh, Tony Breich at uh, the Carnegie uh, Center at, at Stanford um, was instrumental in, in looking at the research to practice constructs and how when you have a kind of community partnership and iterating on solutions, uh, things seem to actually happen and happen very, much more quickly and will have the kinds of lasting power that we're talking about. And the last, of course, is the work that we've done at Digital Promise, we, we call our challenge collaboratives. Um, as you can see from our construct, if you see our website, we live at this intersection of innovation, research, and practice. And we've gotten a ton of experience, frankly, seeing how that work actually um, um, happens. So very quickly, again, a couple of uh, big lessons learned. If you want to read more, there's a full document on this and on our website, but some lessons on Nix. Uh, as you can see, going back to what I was uh, mentioning before, uh, that if you're looking for usable, relevant, timely research, um, you really have to work with community. Let me give you an example on, on the left side here. When I was leading high schools in New York, in New York City, I went to my first AERA conference uh, in San Francisco, and I believe there were 3,000 researchers there. Um, and at that point in my career, I was maybe 20 years in education. I had no idea that ARA existed. I said, oh my God, all this stuff is happening around me. And, and, and I was leading a system of 400 high schools in New York City and I had absolutely no clue that this amount of work was actually happening. So this push around connecting or creating a two-way bridge between research and practice, I think is really, really um, uh, critical. Um, so the this is how we actually implement uh, our inclusive innovation work. Um, we talk about connecting and committing with community, right? The, 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 the far left side takes perhaps far more time than people give, will give um, sort of homage to. Building trust doesn't happen automatically. It takes time to build that. But as you can see from left to right, there is an iterative process of, of working with community around investigating, designing, implementing, iterating, and then looking at ways of sustaining and scaling the program while keeping equity at the center. Um, it is not an afterthought, it is baked in and designed in, in, um, in, in the process. So let me give perhaps a few examples of concrete solutions that uh, we're beginning to see around the development of, of assessments uh, that really leans on this construct of context matters and working with practitioners in community in the design process. Um, David Conley uh, in 2018 published um, in Getting Smart Magazine 10 uh, um, uh, essential ideas on what we need to build on the next generation assessment. So I took the liberty of only highlighting uh, five. Um, I think they're closest to the discussion that we, we're having today. One, it is focused on the learner first and the needs right, of the learner. They are actors, not objects. And we tend to treat students as if they're widgets. Uh, they are living, breathing um, 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 being and the living in, living, breathing, ecosystem so we cannot ignore that kind of uh, that community um, it promotes the kinds of agency that we're talking about it's ownership of learning um, and help develop uh, self-knowledge um, someone talked about you know this idea of newness right um, in, in, in some of the Q&A questions I heard I kept thinking about Vygotsky's zone of proximal development that you've got to meet the learner where they are it can't just build a tool and say go ahead and use it uh, but you really have to engage them in that kind of conversation. Then the third piece around this idea of cumulative validity, I think is also critical because so much of what we do on assessment is a point in time measures. And I, when I was a superintendent, um, I used to really be crazed as to how they were measuring our success year over year, different cohorts of kids, uh, different contexts, different environments. And they were looking to see if we're making progress or not. We never looked, frankly, at the... The, the, the trajectory of a child or be able to build this picture of a person over time so we knew how to engage them in their learning, how to assess their development. We never really did that. Um, and of course, the last one, which is uh, not small, very conscious of equity issues and the ways in which we actually have to design assessments. Um, one thing that, um, again, I believe Ben Schwartz is the Dean of the School of Education at, at, at Stanford. Um, he and uh, Dylan Arena, publisher and head of choice-based assessment. As you can see here too, we're talking about focusing on dispositions over content, looking at this idea of interactive assessments uh, that looks at what, how, and when to learn, right? 
But the big question, it's an amazing construct, uh, but the big question with it, many of these innovations is how do you scale it? How do you make it affordable? Uh, I think the big questions that many of us are beginning um, to ask. So one thing, of course, we're beginning to think about and turning to is AI. So is, is there an opportunity here? And I heard uh, um, from um, a number of folks who were talking about this idea of AI and assessment. So this is one, one uh, sort of a schema that was designed by a group called High Resolves. They're based in Sydney, Australia. They are uh, becoming a partner of us here at Digital Promise. Um, and this is designed around the non-academic development. So we'll talk about the soft skills, right? Tenacity, resilience, et cetera. Um, so looking at one of the curricular platforms called Composer, we are looking at um, perhaps leveraging civics education as a way of looking at the non-academic development of young people, which we know, by the way, is what really begets success. If you ask anyone who's highly successful, what made you successful? Very few people will, will um, list their GPA at, at Stanford or Harvard. Uh, they'll talk about leadership. They'll talk about tenacity. They'll talk about their resilience. So the question of how do you understand and measure that to support the learning of, of young people? So what this does here, uh, so the idea question, and, and we, ha we have an engineers who actually are working on this, on this right now as we speak, is can you actually embed um, uh, assessments in the pedagogy? Can you put sensors into the activities as a way of really crowding a lot of data and really get an understanding of a class of students that teachers can get information from and be able to intervene in the right ways in building their own academic development. So. That is being designed. Um, uh, we're getting some funding for this kind of support. So please stay tuned. If you want to see, um, there's a great white paper written by Murdad Bagai at High Results on their website um, that will perhaps do a bit more justice to this than I, than I am right now. But it's an amazing, an amazing construct. A digital promise again. Um, I see my, my colleagues, Barbara Means, is on, on the line. So uh, Barbara and a few others at Digital Promise brought together 22 world-class AI experts to talk about AI in education uh, and what should we think about um, and know about. And of course, they were not shy in saying that AI can be biased, AI can be, can be racist. So making sure that we understand the kinds of challenges in AI is critically important. But as you'll see here, the, the ideas of connecting machine and human is critical. No one sees AI as replacing the teacher. They see it as augmenting um, the both student and instructor and really supporting um, this idea of really supporting students. And they give us uh, um, seven recommendations. And as you see here, talk about this idea of really expanding the range of learning scenarios, right? Assisting uh, teachers to improve teaching, um, really intensifying and expanding research on AI for assessment of learning. Uh, again, that assessment, you know, um, um, for the sake of assessment, but assessment to really understand us how we understand how students are actually um, are learning. Again, the push on the connection between human and machine, um, real focus on the kinds of ethics and equity. Again, this was a big part of the conversation. And as you can see, as I've been pushing, it really will help to strengthen the overall AI uh, in the, the entire education um, ecosystem. And as we come to a, toward an end here, really want to push this idea. And as, as 30, I've been in education for 35 years, um, and the one thing I know is that uh, education has strong inertia um, and it's hard to change things, which means frankly, we're going to have to push the systems really hard. But if it's done in collaboration with those who are the recipients of our work, then we have a chance of really being successful. So where do we go from here um, at Digital Promise? And we, again, as you, can, as you know, working with a lot of partners in this, uh, in producing the kinds of thought leadership, uh, being a resource hub for information. But we really believe that the inclusive innovation construct could be a powerful way of moving this conversation. And within this construct, we're hoping to have um, systems leaders, ministries of education, teachers, students, uh, principal supervisors, uh, teacher leaders, et cetera, to be part of an ecosystem of driving education innovation uh, forward. So with that, I will stop sharing. Okay.